Today on Raptor. Former police officer Cesar Mancao escapes from the NBI and accuses Senator Lacson of plotting revenge against him. The Philippines gets another vote of confidence, an investment grade rating from Standard & Poor's. There was a bit of underinvestment actually in the power sector. Um, well, the thing is, many in the private sector that have opted to take the wait and see attitude. And Romeo Montenegro of the Mindanao Development Authority says it will take at least two years to solve the power problem in Mindanao. Hello, I'm Maria Ressa. Welcome to Rappler, your social news network. More than 10 hours after walking out of his jail cell, the fugitive Cesar Mancao grants phone interviews to TV stations saying he escaped because of alleged improper treatment by the Justice Department. The former state witness and ex-police officer escapes from the National Bureau of Investigation around 1.40 a.m. Thursday. He faces murder charges over the 2000 killing of publicist Buboy Deser and his driver Emmanuel Corbito. In an interview on ANC, Mancao says, Witnesses are supposed to be given protection, but in my case, I was put in jail. Isn't this a form of harassment? He also accuses Senator Panfilo Lacson of plotting revenge against him. Mancao testified Lacson and his former police aides, Michael Ray Aquino and Glenn Dumlao, were behind the Desser murder. But in 2011, the Court of Appeals dismissed the case against Lacson and declared Mancao an, quote, an incredible and unworthy witness because of his contradicting testimonies. The Supreme Court upheld the CA ruling favoring Lacson and ordered Justice Secretary Laila de Lima in February 2012 to transfer Mancao to the NBI. Mancao confirms he's about to be transferred to the Manila City Jail and says he would be in more danger there. He accuses a certain senator, a quote, certain senator whom he later identified as Lacson as behind the planned transfer. Asked for comment, Laxon says in a text message, that's his and his custodian's problem right now. Aside from that, I would defer any further comment. The Justice Department on Thursday recommends the filing of tax evasion charges against dismissed Chief Justice Renato Corona. The DOJ finds probable cause to charge Corona with failing to pay 120.5 million pesos in taxes and to file his income tax return for six years within 2003 to 2010. The charges are based on a Bureau of Internal Revenue case filed with the DOJ in August of 2012. It would be the first court case against Corona after he was relieved from his post last May following his failure to declare his bank deposits. The BIR said Corona underdeclared the value of his cash assets from 2003 to 2010 by 546 million pesos. Corona says the BIR failed to take into account that part of the funds in his bank accounts came from family members. But the DOJ says the BIR sufficiently proved that there's probable cause to believe that the increase in his net worth came from sources which are taxable. Team Pinoy senatorial candidate Risa Ontivero says she is cautiously optimistic about her improved ranking in the April Pulse Asia survey. After hovering between 13th to 18th place in previous surveys, Ontiveros makes it to the Magic 12 for the first time. Lundag kami, lumuha nung pumasok yung uh, recent Pulse Asia survey results that we really needed that break. So I'm still so happy, but I have to confess uh, it's guarded optimism I feel. Ontiveros is most visible as an advocate of the Reproductive Health Bill. Several church dioceses are campaigning against candidates who supported the bill, but Ontiveros says she believes her campaign for the bill may help her. I think, uh, if at all, it will affect the final days in a positive way. Yeah, I think uh, magdadagdag siya ng extra sipa sa home stretch because if the surveys yes. are to be believed, and I do have faith in them, the surveys about the then RH bill were consistently highly in favor, and I believe even among my fellow Catholics. Do you believe that there is a Catholic vote? Ako naniniwala na may Catholic vote na anti. RH. Kung may Catholic vote man, naniniwala ako na ang anumang Catholic vote ay pro-RH. And I say this as a Catholic. 
A Pulse Asia survey says television advertisements are the voters' biggest source of information about senatorial candidates for the coming May 2013 elections. The survey, conducted from April 20 to April 22, shows 85% of the respondents get information from TV ads. In the National Capital Region and the Visayas, the number rises to 90%. 31% of voters say they get their information from posters and campaign materials. 22% say they get information from TV news programs and radio ads. Nationwide, the internet and social media is a source of information for just 3% of voters, but that rises to 7% in the national capital region. There are fewer political ads running on TV since the Commission on Elections limited the airtime of candidates to 120 minutes total for all TV stations. Brillantes warns candidates against exceeding airtime limits. The Commission on Elections runs ballot counting machines in a final dry run before the May 13th polls. Paterno S. Makel reports. The Comelec tests ballot counting machines one last time before the midterm elections. In Pasay City, Comelec Chair Sixto Brillantes leads the final testing and sealing of PICOS machines. Election inspectors check if the PICOS works. Ten voters also fill out sample ballots to test if the PICOS will accurately count their votes. Later, election inspectors count the votes manually to verify the PICOS tally. They find no discrepancy. The final testing and seeding of PICOS machines here at Botampo Elementary School in Pasay City finished with no major glitches. But seven votes went to waste after some people voted more than the required number of candidates. So a reminder, do not overvote. The activity teaches the public a lesson. The PICOS ignores a person's vote for the party list after he chooses more than one candidate. The machine also junks a set of six votes for councillor. This is after the voter casts an extra vote. Despite minor problems, Brillante says the testing process boosts the credibility of elections. He also says the Comelec has improved based on its experience in 2010. Back then, the Comelec found errors in 76,000 compact flashcards during the final testing and sealing. Brillantes vows this will not happen again. Nangyari yung 2010, hindi sila nagkaroon ng preliminary testing before the final test, which we corrected. Tapos naman masanda kami eh, second year ko eh. Brillante says the final testing and sealing will happen in most other precincts on May 6. The next few days will test the chairman's promise as the nation approaches D-Day. Paterno is Makel Rappler, Manila. The Philippines wins its second investment grade rating, this time from international credit rating firm Standard & Poor's. S&P upgrades the Philippines credit rating from BB plus to BBB minus. This comes after Fitch ratings also raised the Philippines credit rating in March to the same level as A-lister countries. S&P's credit analyst August Bernard says the upgrade on the Philippines reflects a strengthening external profile, moderating inflation, and the government's declining reliance on foreign currency debt. Banco Central ng Pilipinas Governor Amando Tetanco says the upgrade, quote, cements the Philippines' status as an economy with one of the brightest prospects globally. An investment grade tells investors it's safe to do business in the Philippines and encourages them to put capital in the country. Romeo Montenegro of the Mindanao Development Authority says power problems will continue until additional infrastructure is built by 2015. On Tuesday, Montenegro says the Mindanao power grid is on red alert status. This means it lacks 200 megawatts to meet emergency energy demands. Montenegro says underinvestment in the power sector brought this about and now affects development. There was a bit of underinvestment actually in the power sector. Uh, when EPIRA was passed in 2001, it uh, demonopolized from government um, the power sector and it, is, it was left to the private sector Correct. to do everything. Um, well, the thing is many in the private sector would rather have opted to take the wait and see attitude. Because they were uncertain about yeah. government policies. Yeah. And, um, the thing is Montenegro says the government's short-term goal is to address blackouts before focusing on policy change. Right now, we're just focusing on generating the capacities that we wanted to have to address the brownouts. 
um, our next step actually uh, form part of our long term processes, which is the policy. Yeah, right, yes. um, that that's part of our agenda to look at um, certain uh, provisions in the PR that, that need to be modified or need to be addressed, just so um, IPR could be attuned to the to the realities of time because it was implemented ten years ago. You used to work with OPAP. So you worked from Three friends of Boston bombing suspect Zokar Sarnaev are charged Wednesday with trying to cover his tracks and lying to the police. Kazakh nationals Diaz Kadirbayev and Azamat Sajakyakov are accused of conspiring to destroy items belonging to Sarnaev, while Rebel Filipos, an American, is charged with lying to police. The three are accused of trying to help Sarnaev avoid arrest after seeing his picture on television after the April 15th Boston Marathon bombing. According to the formal complaint released by the Justice Department, the three met in Sarnaev's dormitory room on April 18th, where Kadir Bayev and Tajayakov took a backpack containing fireworks to help Sarnaev avoid trouble. When questioned by police, Filippos initially said they did not go to Sarnaev's dorm room, but later confessed he lied to agents. Tajayakov and Kadir Bayev face a maximum sentence of five years in prison and a $250,000 fine. Filippos faces up to eight years in prison and a $250,000 fine. Sarnaev is charged with using a weapon of mass destruction and could face the death penalty. Let's now look at Rappler's Wrap for today, a list of the 10 most important events around the world you shouldn't miss. At number four, speaking at a mass Wednesday, Pope Francis condemns the exploitation of workers and slave labor in a subtle reference to the tragedy in a Bangladeshi garments factory. The Pope says, focusing exclusively on the balance books on financial statements, only looking at making personal profit that goes against God. The death toll at the collapsed garment factory in the outskirts of Dhaka rises to more than 400 a week after the incident. At number five, around 100,000 people are chosen from several million to get a head start on a U.S. green card in what could be the last annual lottery. Created in 1995, the lottery system leads to the awarding of permanent residency permits to 50,000 people from countries that send few immigrants to the United States. But U.S. Republican lawmakers included a plan to scrap it in the comprehensive immigration reforms. A final vote on the reforms is not expected before this summer. And at number 10. Facebook says it will delete video of beheadings posted on the social network. It earlier refused to ban the clip, saying people had the right to show the, quote, world in which we live. Facebook later shifted its position, saying it will remove video reported to the site while it evaluates its policy and approach. The warning comes after a video of a masked man beheading a woman was uploaded on Facebook. The Family Online Safety Institute says Facebook, quote, crossed the line and failed to consider psychological damage on viewers of violent material. For the full top 10, visit rapper.com's The Rap.